Okay, the last thing I need to talk about for the innate immune response is probably the biggest, and that is inflammation. Inflammation is probably the, um, the organizing principle of the innate immune response. It's, it's going to bring all of these other tools that I've talked about together to fight off an invader. And it happens very quickly. Um, after an injury, uh, inflammation begins within minutes, which if you've ever had an injury... Uh, you can probably attest to. If you, like, you know, fall off a bike and chip a bone, to pick one example not entirely at random, uh, within 10 to 15 minutes, you will note your, you know, your limb that you chipped the bone from swelling up and beginning to become inflamed. So what is inflammation. Well, uh, it is caused by tissue damage and or infection. Usually, these two things can happen together, right? If you get tissue damaged, you know, that will often result in a breach in your barriers that infection can come in through. And if you have infection, it is probably causing tissue damage. The function of in inflammation is to A, contain the damage, B, uh, localize a response, muster all of your body's resources to go to that place where the damage is, eliminate the invader, and heal the tissue. There are four to five-ish, depending upon the book that you look in, uh, what are called cardinal signs of inflammation. You should know these. They are swelling, redness, heat, pain, and loss of function. So how does inflammation occur? Well, usually it begins with uh, PRRs, most particularly toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors. So toll-like receptors are going to be detecting stuff in the extracellular environment. Nod-like receptors are going to be detecting bacteria, specifically in the internal environment. Um, Rig-like receptors detect viruses, and viruses may or may not cause inflammation. Um, usually they don't cause inflammation until the cells start dying, but it depends on the virus. Uh, but so these pattern recognition receptors detect PAMPs associated with pathogens and DAMPs associated with damage, right? dead cells, your dead cells. Uh, and so what sorts of things have TLRs? Sentinel cells have TLRs. Remember, that's going to be the phagocytic, uh, the mononuclear phagocytes, that's monocytes, um, dendritic cells, and macrophages, and your alarm cells. Uh, mast cells and basophils. Uh, either way, um, no matter what type of cell detects it, it's either going to directly release histamine or it's going to activate a basophil or mast cell to release histamine. But like when these PRRs get triggered, 
They result in the production of cytokines, histamine, and tumor necrosis factor. All of those are uh, pro-inflammatory elements. Um, and one of the things that these do is they act on the liver to release acute phase proteins, um, things like upping the amount of complement protein that you have and things like that. So let's take a picture here. So the first thing that happens, right? So here, let's say you got stabbed by something, right? You got stabbed, you're walking through the forest and you trip and fall on this big, thorny, muddy thing. And it like stabs into your tissue, bursts past your, your barrier and deposits a whole bunch of pathogens deep into your, uh, your skin and subcutaneous fat. Well, pretty quickly, these pathogens are going to be detected by local mast cells, which are, of course, associated with your barriers. The mast cells degranulate, producing histamine. Now, histamine has a few different effects on the vasculature, the capillaries nearby. So, um, if you have, let's go here. So here's a normal capillary. with uh, red blood cells flowing through it. And then like, let's add some histamine to it. And we'll do these little blue H's for histamine. Okay, so note that the capillary has expanded, right? So you get uh, vasodilation in the area of inflammation. Uh, vasodilation means you're going to bring in more blood. Uh, not only do you get vasodilation in the area where you, you had the injury or the, the infection, um, but you'll actually get some vasoconstriction farther down as a natural consequence. And so this might be quite a bit farther down. So what does this mean? Well, vasodilation means you have more blood coming in. Vasoconstriction means you have less blood going out. So BP, blood pressure, is going to increase significantly. Local blood pressure, by the way, just in this area. Um, Systemically, blood pressure will go down. But in this area, you've got more blood coming in, less blood going out. That's going to increase the pressure, right? It's going to blow up the balloon. Second thing that happens is uh, that the histamine is going to induce a change. And it's actually the bradykinin does this a lot more, but histamine starts the process. Uh, it's going to induce a change in the capillaries, causing them to become leaky. And more permeable. Now, you don't just have uh, blood cells floating around. You've got... Nutrient molecules, which I'm going to do here in green. 
and you've got uh, complement proteins, which I'm going to do here in yellow. You have other proteins as well. So you've got like a bunch of um, uh, of other stuff floating around in uh, in your blood. So you increase the blood pressure and you make the blood vessels leaky. Well, what happens? These nutrient molecules are going to come out and they'll get squeezed out of your blood vessels. And that's going to be important because you're going to need those nutrient molecules uh, to fight off the infection. You are also going to get these complement proteins and other defensive proteins. Proteins are small enough to squeeze out through these holes. The cells, at least red blood cells, won't automatically squeeze out. Okay. So that's what's happening thus far, but that's not all that's going to happen. The histamine is going to cause, and I'm going to kind of draw this on the other side here. Uh, the histamine is going to cause the inner lining of these capillaries to produce special proteins. Now, normally, a white blood cell, which I don't seem to have a white right here, so I'm going to use yellow. So, normally, a white blood cell would just whoosh, go down the middle, right? But these blue triangle thingies that I've drawn here, these are proteins that grab hold and slow down the, uh, the white blood cell. So this white blood cell is gonna actually bind to the side of the blood vessel. And it's going to, instead of just flowing, kind of roll until it stops. And when it stops, it's going to begin to flatten out. It's going to actually change its shape. It's going to go really, really flat and really, really thin. And squeeze out through these little holes in the capillary. This process is called extravasation. Uh, or diapodesis. So uh, we'll go ahead and write that down here. This is extra vasation or diapodesis. Um, and, uh, you know, neutrophils will do this, monocytes will do this. Uh, when neutrophils go through, they mostly just go through. Um, but when monocytes squeeze through, they turn into macrophages on the other side. Uh, and so the effects of, of inflammation right here are that 
you expand uh, the, the capillary, uh, bringing in more blood. Bringing in more blood means that you are bringing in um, uh, more nutrients, more blood proteins, and more white blood cells. More blood flow means more white blood cells coming in. The capillary becomes more leaky, causing nutrient molecules and defensive proteins to channel into this area. Remember, this is the area that has the damage and the infection. You are also going to capture and extravasate white blood cells traveling by. So any white blood cells that happen to be coming by this neighborhood are going to get caught and siphoned out. All of this directs your body's resources, your nutrients, your defensive proteins, your defensive cells, to come right to the site of inflammation, where they're all going to have a nice war against whatever it is that has infected you. Now let's take a think on those four cardinal signs of inflammation, all right? Redness. Why would inflammation cause you to become red? Well, you've got more blood going to the area. Blood is red. So, yes, that's why you get redness. Uh, you have um, uh, uh, vasodilation leading to increased blood flow. Swelling. So the swelling is because you have all of this fluid exiting, being squeezed out of your blood vessels. And that fluid is taking nutrients and proteins and things like that with it as it comes out. But if you have fluid that's exiting your blood vessels into the surrounding tissue, that's going to cause swelling. All right. Heat. Why would you have heat? Well, two reasons. One is because you have more blood going to the area. Blood is what carries your body's heat around. Anywhere that you channel blood to gets more heat. So that makes sense. But that doesn't actually account for all of it. You also have these uh, molecules called pyrogens. Pyrogens increase the heat of your body. They can do so on a localized level at, say, a site of injury, or they can do so throughout your entire body, producing fever. Why would you do this? Well, your blood cells are optimized to operate at a higher temperature than your body normally is. You want your blood cells to only be at their most active when your body is extra hot. It kind of helps you to control it. Microbes, on the other hand, are usually tuned to uh, be at your body's normal temperature. This is particularly true for viruses that infect your normal cells and therefore operate at whatever temperature your normal cells operate at. So by increasing the temperature, you can cause the pathogens to become less effective and your own immune system cells to become more effective, giving you a little bit of an advantage. Pain. Well, the pain is a sort of natural consequence of all of the pressure that's being applied to nerve endings in the area, but also some of the cytokines and chemicals that are produced sensitize your pain nerves to hurt because your body doesn't care about how comfortable you are. Your body wants you to leave that area the heck alone, so it's going to make it hurt. So you stop using it. And the last is loss of function. This is kind of a generic term that can have a whole bunch of different causes. 
Um, but mostly it's caused by the fact that it's like, you know, if you've got a swollen arm, it's hard to use that arm. Um, you know, if something swells up to a big size, it's not going to function exactly the same way that it did before. I want to narrow in on the heat aspect because I mentioned that, you know, heat can be like localized to the site of like, say you, you uh, I don't know, you broke your arm. Um, the site of that injury is going to get hot, right? But also, heat can operate at a systemic level, producing fever. Uh, fever is a raising of the body temperature, generally an indication of infection, particularly bacterial infection. Um, viruses tend to produce mild to medium fevers, whereas bacterial infections, depending upon the type, can produce very, very high fevers, especially gram-negative bacteria. Uh, and this is actually something that your body does. I was just talking about your body normally holds your temperature, your thermostat is normally set at 37 degrees, but this is something that can be regulated. Um, there are chemicals that can cause that to go up or down. Chemicals that raise your temperature are called pyrogens. Pyro, heat, gen to generate. Should be pretty easy to remember, right? Uh, pyrogens, many of them are things that your body makes, right? And your body is causing you to become fevered because your immune system cells work better at higher temperatures, so you're upping the effectiveness of your immune system, and pathogens usually work less well at higher temperatures, so you're lowering the effectiveness of the pathogens. All well and good. Uh, there are certain microbes that also produce pyrogens, particularly uh, endotoxins and gram negatives, also capsules, and a few other toxins as well. Um, moderate temperature increases are unpleasant, but part of the healthy immune response. But if a fever gets too high, it can kill you. Uh, like a lot of the immune system, it's balanced on a knife's edge. Your immune system has to respond fast and hard, or the pathogens will win. But if it responds too hard, it can kill you. And your immune system rides that knife's edge really close. Um, many, particularly bacteria, produce toxins, endotoxins and exotoxins, that act as what are called super antigens. This is something that we'll talk about when we talk about uh, toxins later on. But super antigens basically crank your immune system up to 11. They can cause your fever to go up to like, you know, 40, 41, 42 degrees uh, Celsius, which is hot enough to start damaging your brain. Um, and they can cause your inflammatory response to become systemic. Remember I said your inflammatory response causes vasodilation? That's good if it happens in an area because then you're channeling your resources to that area. What happens if you have a systemic vasodilation? Uh, and a systemic edema. Well, suddenly your blood vessels are a lot bigger. That causes your blood pressure to drop to the floor, right? And they're all permeable. So all over your body, your blood is losing fluid into the tissues, which is gonna cause your blood pressure to drop through the floor, down into the basement, and keep going. And if your blood pressure drops 
actually low blood pressure is super, super dangerous. High blood pressure isn't exactly good for you, right? But high blood pressure is going to kill you in 20 years. Low blood pressure is going to kill you in 20 seconds. Well, probably not exactly 20 seconds, but like low blood pressure means that you can't pump blood to your brain because you don't have enough pressure to get it to the top floor. And your brain dies very quickly without blood. The low blood pressure kills you right fast. And this is a condition that we call shock. Excessive inflammatory response can and will cause shock. And this is something you need to watch out for when dealing with patients who have severe inflammation. 